tonight as we graduate, as we realize that tonight our childhood ends, tomorrow morning our adulthood begins, that you be with us and help us live our lives the best we know how for you and how for ourselves. I pray, lastly and most importantly, that if there's any graduate tonight who has not yet accepted you as a personal Savior, that they will before they die so that one day we can all be together again in heaven for our final reunion. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in the Sarah Pledge of Trust to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now join us as we sing God Bless America.
With the passing of time, we have acquired knowledge, understanding, and friendships. With the help of many, we are prepared to meet tomorrow's challenges. Teachers and other faculty members, we want to thank you for your testimonies and dedication. You've watched us grow and change and have encouraged us all the way through. To achieve all that's possible in our lives, you have often encouraged us to attempt the impossible. You have helped, you have helped us to dream of being more than we are. We thank you for giving us your best, that we might in turn give our best to others. Each of us possess different talents and different dreams. We have worked hard to reach this point in our lives, but our quest for knowledge does not end with our graduation tonight. It must continue into our future, no matter where the path may lead, to college, marriage, or the workplace. And we must be an influence on those who come after us. We have the power to make a new and better tomorrow. So, fellow classmates, I can think of no better advice than that of Paul as he spoke to the churches at Ephesus and Philippi. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you, and God bless you. President of the Academy, faculty and staff, family and friends, fellow seniors, welcome to Gilly Christian Academy's graduation ceremony for the class of 1991. My name is Michael Davis, and I stand before you tonight as a result of hard work, long hours, and many blessings from God, the co valedictorian of the senior class. Seniors, tonight marks a great milestone in all of our lives. 
13 years, we've worked tirelessly and effortlessly to reach this goal. Tonight, we're at the threshold that takes us into a threshold that takes us into a new part of our lives with new responsibilities and horizons to conquer. We must not, however, forget our years here at the Academy, for they make up the most important years for our lives, our foundations and building blocks of life. What we have learned here will be fundamental in all of the decisions we'll make in the future. In my opinion, we are more than adequately prepared. Tonight, everyone will hear two valedictorian speeches. Every year, every graduation, two speeches are given. The speeches have just seemed to become a part of the ceremony to take up time. But tonight, although everyone will hear it, I wrote this speech for two people in focus. I would like to dedicate it to my parents. I can never be what I am tonight without the Lord's guidance and my parents sent me here for 13 years. They've really worked hard and sacrificed to send me and my brother here for our entire 13 year school career. I can't thank them enough. It was not only my dad's hard work to send me here that I'm so thankful for, but it was mostly all the time that he spent with him. He was never too busy to take me hunting or fishing, and he always had time to sit down and talk with him. With the time we spent together at the lake fishing or in the woods hunting a white tailed deer, we have developed a love and a relationship between a father and a son that was raised with nothing in the world. My mother is a homemaker, she's really made our home what it is. She, she does almost everything for me, from washing and ironing my clothes, cooking all the meals, keeping the house clean. I could never thank my mother enough for all the time and love that she has provided for me. Seniors, never forsake your parents. Our lives would never do what they are tonight if it weren't for all our parents. We need to thank them more than what we, we take them for granted. Uh, I would like to publicly thank you, Mom and Dad, for everything you've done. I can only hope and pray that my hard work shows how grateful and thankful and appreciative that I really am. May God richly bless your lives for all the sacrifices you have made. I would like to thank the faculty for the job well done. We come to school every day and face your teachers and coaches under many circumstances. You people really have an influence on the lives of the students who pass through this institution. Keep up the good work. In closing, I would like to encourage every senior here tonight to, to live their lives and strive for God's will. A Christian cannot make it in today's world without God. The sooner we realize that, the more of a success we'll be in life. Always remember our class verse, John 15, 13 and that we're always friends. Congratulations, Class 9-1. And may God richly bless each and every one of you. Appreciate that. Um, my name is Rachel Reedley, and I've been attending Billy for 13 years. I was saved at the age of four years old, and was um, baptized shortly thereafter. Um, I'd like to thank you, Mom and Dad, for all your, your sacrifice financially and with your time to make me what I am today. I'd like to thank you, um, faculty and staff, for um, pouring your knowledge into me. And I'd like to thank you, Class 91. I love y'all, and I wish y'all the best in the world. Good evening. My name is Danny Shipp, and I've been at Gilead for since ninth grade. I was saved at age nine during some services at Pine Park Baptist Church. I'd like to take this time to thank my mom and dad. For their hard work, sacrifice. They didn't have to send me to a Christian school. They could have sent me to a public school. But they took the sacrifices and they worked hard to send me here. And now I have more than just education. I have Christian education. And that means more to me than you'll ever know. I'd also like to take this time to thank my coaches, teachers, and Pastor Upton for, his hard, for their hard work, their diligence, and their godly leadership. I'd also like to take this time to thank the class of 91 for your good times, helping through the hard times, and always being there for me. May God bless each and every one of your lives. Thank you. My name is 
Rebecca Robertson. I'm a TV dealer for 13 years. At the age of 11, I accept the price of my personal savings. Um, I would like to thank this time to thank my mother um, for all the hard work and diligence that allowed, and enabled me to remain in a Christian school. And also for her godly example that she's been to me, not only for the 13 years that I've been in school, but for the 18 years of my life. I would also like to thank my, um, my, all my teachers for the um, values that they instilled in me, and not only in the classroom, but also through their personal lives and testimonies. I'd also like to thank my class for being such good friends, especially those of you that have been with me for 13 years. I want each and every one of you to know that I wish you the best that I can possibly offer. My name is Jay Carr, and I've been attending Gilly for 13 years. I was saved at the age of six. I asked my parents to remain at the church one Sunday night so that I may uh, talk to the pastor. And he led me in the plan of salvation, and I accepted Christ as my uh, personal Lord and Savior. Um, Growing up in a Christian home and uh, attending a Christian school, you're always in Bible class and chapel, church, and you, know, you can find yourself really easy just uh, sitting and listening to what they have to say and not applying it. And it takes a little extra effort to apply what they have to say and what God has for you in your life. Uh, this summer, I planned on, uh, I really hoped I was playing American Legion baseball. And I thought it was God's will in my life, and I had uh, family praying for me, friends. And I really thought that, thought it was God's will in my life until. Uh, he showed me otherwise. And I pray for the seniors that they'll keep God's will and always search for God's will in their lives. And that they'll look for His will, not their will instead. I want to thank my parents for the hard work and the love and sacrifice and just their effort to send me here. And the times that they spent with me and showed me the love that a Christian parent should. I want to thank the faculty for all their, uh, their, their love and their sharing and just their uh, unendless time that they have for you. Thank you. This time, I'd like to read something that I wrote during the course of this school year. And um, I don't exactly know when I wrote it. But um, I wanted you, my class, to know that when I wrote this, you, my Christian friends, were the ones I was thinking about. Some title, like God's children are friends forever. I won't always know what you're going through, but you can rest assured I'll always pray for you. I know God's got us all in His hands. He's holding us together because He always understands. The reflections I see now, they seem so real somehow, but they're only pictures in my mind of all those special times. Our faces can never hide the friendship we feel inside. I've got to tell you, I love you, and I'm always going to miss you. All the things that we've been through, and now I have to say goodbye to you. After everything we've said and done, Never thought the end to this would come. We've known each other for so long. Now we've got to face this world alone. But I will pray for you each night that you will be God's shining light. We've just got to keep each other in our hearts and He will never let us grow apart. We know our friendship will never end because one day we'll all be together in heaven. All God's children are friends forever. And now I'd like to call Pastor Huffman if he'd stand up here. Next presentation. This is what we did for our class project. And we just want you to know this is for everything she's done for us. The only has really changed all of our lives. This is a Christian winner's creed. It says, I believe that a true winner always does his best, never to the glory of self, but always to the glory of God. With the Lord's help, I will strive to be a true winner today. Presented by the class of 91. Hey, we have many awards to present tonight, and that's what we like to do this time. We have all those displayed here. 
And uh, we'll ask these young people, if they would, to come, the seniors to come to the platform as I call their names. First of all, in the academic area, we have co-valedictorians this year. First of all, finishing first in English, first in science, first in business, second in history, second in foreign language, Raina Unruh. And you may acknowledge their accomplishments. Finishing first in history, first in foreign language, second in English, second in math, second in science, Michael Davis. And our honor graduates this year, finishing first in math, third in English, and third in history, Bradley Robertson. Second in business, third in math, third in science, Eric Rye. Third in foreign language, and third in business, Rachel Rigby. Happy to be here with you this evening. I'm here on behalf of the Woodlands. Uh, we have numerous community service projects, and our American History Award is one of them. All of you seniors tonight are winners. There are no losers in this room. Could I have Michael Davis please come up? certificate by to us that they would like for us to present tonight. This is for academic achievement in the area of math and science, and uh, this certificate also goes to Michael Davis. We've got a young man graduating with the class tonight that we like to recognize because we appreciate the effort that was put forth on his part. Uh, Michael Gardner. Is graduating with the class tonight. I don't know how many of you know this, but Michael was with this class a couple years, and uh, over the summer, uh, this past summer, uh, it was necessary for Michael to have some extensive surgery, and he was not able to continue with his class. Uh, but Michael didn't let that slow him down. He went ahead and got his GED, and uh, he's graduating here tonight. And uh, we want to just kind of commemorate that. So we have a plaque we'd like to present to him. It says, Michael Gardner, Gilead Christian Academy, congratulates you on the completion of your general education diploma, May 31st, 1991. Michael? Okay, 
many of our young people participated in our Georgia Association of Christian Schools Fine Arts Festival this year. We gave some of those awards to the underclassmen last night at our awards banquet. We had several, several of our seniors who uh, excelled in that area during the competition. It is a competition, and uh, those who finished in first, second, or third place throughout our Christian schools in the state uh, received some certificates. Uh, we have also purchased some medals from the Georgia Association of Christian Schools that we'd like to present to them tonight and honor their, uh, recognize their achievement in this area. But uh, first of all, finishing second place in create, creative writing in the poetry area, Brent McBride. <laughs> then we had three young ladies, or excuse me, two young ladies and a young man who were part of a choral group. Uh, that finished in second place in the state, uh, Dawn Bodry, Shelley Hawkins, and Paul McFather. Okay. okay, then finished in third place in the Woodwind Solo uh, category with Shelley Hawkins. Shelly's here. She also finished third place in poetry reading. And, uh, and finishing third place in home economics testing, Rachel Rigby. Okay, just before we pre present our Christian Character Award, we'll do that in just a moment. I'm going to ask. Uh, uh, Dr. Greg Huffman, if you would, President of Gilead Christian Academy, to come and present our President's Award tonight. It's always a thrill to be able to work with high school students. I've talked to some pastors who have said that they would just as soon not pastor if they had to pastor a church that had a Christian school. I'd just soon not pastor if I had to pastor a church that didn't have a Christian school. We enjoy our students. Uh, it's, it's always uh, tear jerking to watch a senior class leave. And I guess the longer I'm gonna be here, the more difficult it will be to watch each one of our seniors leave us. We thank the Lord that 10 of them are members of our church and we're excited about what God has in store for them. The President's Award is given by me to an individual that I believe wants to serve the Lord. It also has a scholarship to go to a Christian college, a $200 scholarship to help toward a Christian college. And the recipient of this award tonight is a young lady that plans to attend Northland Baptist College, Shelley Hawkins. Shelley, would you come? Here? We have five of these are Christian Character Awards. Uh, we feel like this is probably the highest award any student can receive here. Uh, our faculty and staff has a great deal of the input here, and these are the young people that they've observed their lives this year, and they've seen the kind of testimony they've had, uh, not only in the classroom, but on the ball field and different areas, and uh, we think that the Christian character in their lives needs to be rewarded, and we'd like to do that at this time. First of all, uh, receiving a Christian Character Award, Mr. Jay Carr. Also, Michael Davis. Tasha Freeman. Danny Ship. And finally, Eric Rye.
It's our privilege to be able to have Dr. Charles Davis with us as our commencement speaker. Dr. Davis is the president of Trinity Baptist College in Jacksonville, Florida, founded by Dr. Bob Gray. And numbers of our students from GLA Christian Academy have gone to Trinity and more will go in the future. And we're just thrilled to be able to have him come and speak to our hearts from the Word of God, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Pastor. It's a joy to be here tonight. Thank God for the invitation. Appreciate the excitement of a commencement exercise. It's always uh, enjoyable to stand and sit on the platform, detect what's going on in the lives of these young people. You can see them as I see them. They are torn with all sorts of emotions. I know they're excited about graduating. They're sorry that this era of their life has come to an end, I believe. And uh, obviously, through the poetry and other things that have been said, demonstrates a great camaraderie between these young people. So it's a joy to be here. So I address you young people tonight. So, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, and Principal, faculty, staff, graduates, amazed moms and dads, and proud pawpaws and grandmas. Tonight I invite you, if you have your Bible, to turn to Luke chapter 2. We'll be using one verse in this passage. You would think that we would have a lot of verses in the Bible to describe the adolescent years of our Savior. The fact of the matter is, we only have one verse in the Bible that describes his life. That verse reads, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That one verse says it all. He is our example. He's the super exemplary individual of our lives. Tonight, if I were asked these young people, or maybe even moms and dads, if you could define success for me tonight, invariably the definition would come back something like this. Success is measured by what we attain or what we accomplish in life. And while that sounds like a reasonable definition, the fact of the matter is, it is a definition of the world. The world constantly measures our success by what we do, what we attain, what we accumulate compared to others. The Bible teaches us that it's wrong for us to compare one another to each other. And the fact remains that success, I believe according to the Word of God, is not measured by what we attain or accumulate in life. The success is actually measured by what we attain or what we accumulate in light of what we could have attained or what we could have accumulated. And rather than our being able to compare ourselves to other individuals to find out whether or not we have been successful, we then measure success by ourselves. I don't like our grading system. It sounds strange, doesn't it, from an administrator of a Bible college? But invariably, when we begin to give out A's, B's, C's, or D's, we begin to compare students with each other. In my heart, I'm against that, and yet that's the very thing that we do at our college. I wish I knew of a better way of doing it. But the fact remains, if I had two students on the platform, one of which I said made straight C's in school, and another one that made straight B's, now I would ask you which of these two students is the most successful. Invariably, we would say it's got to be the one that made straight B's. But wait a minute, there's something I failed to tell you. The fact is, the one that made straight C's did the very best job that he or she could do. In other words, this individual was operating at maximum productivity. He could not do any better than that. But the fellow that made straight B's could have made straight A's. Now then, we realize that he is not operating at maximum productivity, but he's operating as an underachiever. And my challenge to you young people tonight, 
who are graduating, and every mom and dad and those that are interested in these graduates, that we realize that success is not measured by what we attain compared to others, but what we attain in light of what we could have attained. I challenge you young people, beginning tonight, you might determine in your heart that you're not going to be an underachiever, but that you're going to operate at maximum productivity. That you're going to do the very best job you can do. For you see, if we took the world's standard of success and measured the life of Jesus Christ, we would find that he was a miserable failure. For instance, today, many people determine success by how much we own. If we were to ask Jesus Christ for his uh, statement of assets, I'm afraid that he wouldn't have much. In fact, I don't know that he owned anything. According to the world, he would have been a miserable failure. If we were to measure success by how much money that an individual had, again, we'd ask Jesus to produce his balance sheet, show us his uh, profit and loss statement, and we'd find that he didn't have much money at all. In fact, when it got time for him to pay his taxes, he sent his disciples down to the lake to pick out a certain fish that had a coin in his mouth. I like that. I wish we could do that. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> Again, Jesus would be a miserable failure. If we measure success by one's uh, wardrobe, I wonder if Jesus Christ is one of the ten top dressers of Israel. I doubt that. In fact, I assume that he wore very simple clothing. Again, according to the world standard of success, I believe that Jesus Christ would have been a miserable failure. We measure success by the vehicle that we drive. Again, we look at what Jesus had. He didn't have anything. In fact, when it got time for him to make his triumphal entry, entry into Bethphage, Bethany, uh, and Bethlehem, he sent his disciples into the city and asked them to find a little donkey the foal of an ass, one that had never been ridden before. And they brought the donkey out to him, put their clothing on him, so that, on the donkey, so that Jesus might make his triumphant entry into those cities. He didn't ride a great white horse of valor like most kings did. The fact is he chose a very simple mode of transportation. Again, according to the world, he was a miserable failure. If we measure success by the numbers of friends we had, Jesus Christ had one of his friends that betrayed him. He had one that denied even knowing who he was. And when the pressure came, every last one of them turned and fled. Again, he would have been measured as a miserable failure. If we measure success by longevity, here's a man that lived to the ripe old age of 33. Now years ago, that seemed awfully old to me. Today, 33 is a spring chicken. But the fact of the matter is, he didn't live a very long life. Again, he would have been a miserable failure. He was condemned, beaten, stripped, crucified. And yet we know, as believers, that he's the greatest example of success man could ever know. He was the King of kings, the Lord of lords. If there was ever an example to follow young people, as one that was operating at maximum productivity, it would be our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here we find in this one verse four important building blocks of life. We find that Jesus Christ increased in wisdom. He increased in stature. He increased in favor with God and with man. Let me deal quickly with these four areas. The basic building blocks of the Christian life. In order for you to build the superstructure of your Christian life, it's going to be imperative that you have the basics, the foundation established. Apart from that, you will not be able to build a tall, strong superstructure of your Christian life, but you might be building the Leaning Tower of Pisa simply because you didn't have the right foundation. Notice, first of all, Jesus Christ increased in wisdom. Wisdom. Think of that. Think of a huge building block down here on the floor, and it was marked wisdom. As we read the Word of God, the Lord put a great premium on the word wisdom. Young people, 
If there was ever a day a graduate from high school needed to have wisdom, it's today. If there was ever a time when men and women needed wisdom, it's today. Now, wisdom defined is simply this, looking at life from God's point of view. That sounds simple, doesn't it? In fact, every time you find the word wisdom in the Bible, you can plug that definition into it. Let me say it one more time. Looking at life from God's point of view. Now, if you don't look at life from God's point of view, you only have one other option, and that is to look at life from man's point of view. We realize that God wants us to increase in wisdom as Christ did. Now, this is the mental side of your life. I know that most of you plan to further your education. I hope you have decided that this is the end of the mental prowess of your life. Hopefully you have decided to put your mind in neutral and now coast the rest of your life. Hopefully you have a desire to expand the horizons of knowledge that God is able to give you from many different areas. We have heard in times past that a mind is a terrible thing to waste, and certainly that is true. I think it's important that you determine that you're going to allow your mind to gather and soak up knowledge and truth of the Word of God so that you might be able to be used by God in a great way. The only way I know how to look at life from God's point of view is to know how God looks at life. And the only way I know how to find that out is the Word of God. After hearing the testimonies tonight and hearing what you uh, uh, valedictorians have had to say and the poetry that has been read, obviously there is a deep sense of spirituality among these young people. And my hat is off to you for that. And I thank God for that. But I trust that this is just the beginning. That you'll determine in your heart that you'll never set the Word of God aside. That you'll determine to allow the Word of God to speak to your heart on a daily basis. So that you might be able to expand your horizons in the area of wisdom. So that you might be able to look at life from God's point of view. You don't have to be Socrates. You don't have to be Aristotle to be a philosopher. There are many people today that are philosophizing every day. They simply begin a sentence like this. Well, I think, or I believe, but you know, young people, it doesn't matter what you think or what I think. The important thing is, what does God think? That is the most important thing. And when you determine to look at life from God's point of view, when it comes time to go to college, when it comes time to seek, seek out the uh, life mate that you're going to have, when it comes time for you to buy an automobile, when it comes time for you to buy uh, a, a home, whatever it might be, you might be able to know that God is giving you direction. This is the reason why God has given this example to us that we might increase in wisdom. It's important now that you determine to read good books. It's important now that you determine in your heart that you're going to learn as much as you possibly can and operate at maximum productivity. The second building block of the Christian life, God said that Jesus Christ increased in stature. Now, this is the physical side of life. You know, I don't like the way Hollywood depicts Jesus Christ. Usually, he's the effeminate-looking individual, weak and anemic. I don't believe that's the way Jesus was at all. I believe that he was an excellent physical specimen. Maybe not a Charlie Atlas, but the fact of the matter is, after 30 years in a carpenter shop, Certainly, he must have built up the upper torso of his body uh, through exercise. The Bible says that daily he walked long distances, and as, at the end of those uh, uh, hikes, he'd be able to preach and meet the needs of the people, obviously building the lower torso of his body. The Bible teaches us that he drove out the money changers out of the temple. I can't imagine that a weak, effeminate individual would be able to do that. Can you imagine Jesus standing in the temple and saying, Get out of here, fellas. I don't believe so. I believe he had the, the voice and the body to back up uh, the charges of them to get out of the temple. I'm convinced that it's important that we have the right kind of physical body. Now, you young people are growing up in a soft age, fast food land. Uh, we oftentimes don't take care of our bodies like we should. Oh, we preach against smoking, and I hope you don't smoke. Ever. 
We preach against drinking, and certainly you ought not to do that. We preach against drugs. We say no to drugs, and hopefully you have never allowed drugs to enter your body. Don't you see that the body that God has given us is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And therefore, it's important for us to determine to keep our bodies in as best shape as we possibly can. Now, these young people look pretty well in shape, don't they? The fact is that when they begin to get into college and then they start thinking about getting married, it seems like as soon as our young people in college get married, they begin to broaden their horizons. <laughs> this is usually the part of the sermon that people don't like because we don't like to get in shape. We don't like to stay in shape. But I think it's important, young people, that you determine to not allow anything to come into your body that is going to hurt your body. And then I think it's important for you to have the proper rest and to have the proper exercise. And here's the reason why. Right now, it's inconceivable to you that you would ever be infirm. But you know, down the line, when you get a little bit older, the fact is that you may be infirm because you didn't take care of your body now. But what if everybody in this whole auditorium would determine to take care of their body on a daily basis? How much more time would we be able to give to God by virtue of the fact that throughout our entire life, we were able to serve God with a healthy body? I challenge you young people that you take this as a challenge right now that you're going to keep your body fit and trim. I heard one of the young men say he wanted to play baseball uh, this summer. Obviously God gave him another direction. But surely he's going to continue to keep his body fit and trim. And this ought to be the determination of every individual that maintained their body as Christ did. Thirdly, not only did he increase in stature and increase in wisdom, being the mental, now the physical. But thirdly, he increased in favor with God. And so the third building block is the spiritual side of life. We have the mental, the physical, and now the spiritual side of life. You see, Christ had a mission. He had a responsibility. As God sent him to this earth, he had a responsibility to accomplish, and he did precisely what he was asked to do. Young people, that's exactly what spirituality is. It's not my responsibility to determine what God's will is for your life. You have to determine that yourself according to the dictates of the Word of God. I've often thought I could make a lot of money if I opened up an office someplace and put a big sign out the front saying, I can determine God's will for your life, $25 a piece. Or maybe 50 There's enough gullible Christians in the world today that would probably stand too deep for two blocks just to find someone else telling them what God's will is for their life. But that's absurd, isn't it? Because I can't determine God's will for your life. I have enough trouble determining God's will for my own life, let alone yours. But you know, we're so concerned about God's will for our life where it might be a year from now, or five years from now, maybe 10 or 15 years from now. But that's not what God is interested in. He's interested in us knowing God's will every day. And if we would determine to do the will of God in increments of 24 hours each, we would find that a year from now would take care of itself. In other words, in the next 24 hours, it's my responsibility to determine what God wants me to do. And as I accomplish that successfully, then I'm able to start working on the next 24 hours. You know, next week, next year, will take care of itself. If we stay in the will of God every day, 5, 10, 15 years down the line, we'll still be doing what God wants us to do. So we realize that it's not an easy task. It is an awesome task and responsibility to determine the mind of God for our life. But that's your job. How easy it's been for you to look to the faculty, to look to the administration, to look to mom and dad. Now it's going to be your responsibility. One fellow said tonight, Tomorrow, we'll be adults. Isn't that something? I mean, isn't it amazing what one night can do? My youngest son graduated from high school last Friday night. That's the end of an era for us. 
So I told him, son, you're now a man. You're an adult. I expect you to act like one. You know, I thank God for the commencement time. I always thought when I was growing up that commencement meant it was the end of something. But the word commence means to begin something. And that's exactly what's taking place tonight. You are now being weaned away from these who you have found your security. And now you're going to become independent, little by little. Not only do you become independent of mom and dad, you become independent of the faculty and staff that are here, but you have a responsibility to grow and know precisely what God wants you to do. No longer are you going to be able to look to these folks to meet that need. This is a time of maturation in your life that you'll determine to know the mind of God for your life every day. Finally, the fourth building block of this spiritual life that we're talking about, this exemplary life of our Savior, not only was there a fact that he had to grow mentally, physically, then of course spiritually, but finally he said he increased in favor with man. Now we get to the social side of life. Social side. What in the world would that be? If God had given me the opportunity to design the incarnation of Jesus Christ, this is how I would have done it. I would have had Jesus be born in some great learning center, some great hospital of higher learning, where they do research, where they have stained, stainless floors, they would, they would have uh, sterile floors and, and beautiful hallways. And I would, nothing would have been too good for our Savior. I would have him grow up in great surroundings. Send him to the finest schools available. The finishing schools. The finest colleges. And then I would have prepared a great palace in which he might live. Great white ivory palace, huge steps going up to the palace, and inside that palace would be a huge throne, a great white throne. And on that throne there would be a great red cushion where he might sit. And then I would clothe him in royal regal robes. I'd put a crown on his head that would be gold and jewel, a crown of royalty. In his right hand, I put a scepter, one where he could rule and reign over this earth. It's probably a good thing God didn't ask me to do it, because God had an altogether different idea for our Savior. It wasn't a great burning center where he was born. As we know, it was in a simple manger. It wasn't sterile, dirty. Dressed him in swaddling clothes, death clothes. It's hard to believe that our Savior faced the inception of life in these surroundings. Oh, he didn't go to finishing schools. He didn't have the opportunity to go to the finest colleges. He did not have a white palace in which he might live. But the Bible says that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to the needs of the people. And young people, this is the secret of life. Many a man has become the richest man in the world only to die as a recluse, a hermit, miserable, having never found peace, joy, and happiness. If indeed Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to be ministering to the needs of the people, he didn't come to be worshipped, he came to serve. Young people, no matter, no matter what field in which God might lead you, 
I guarantee you, until you find somebody that needs you, somebody to whom you might be able to meet their need, somebody that is hurting, somebody that needs guidance and direction and help from you, until you determine in your heart to have a servant's heart, not that someone might serve you, but that you might find somebody to whom you might serve. Happiness will always be eluding your grasp. I double dog dare you to determine in your heart that you're going to have a servant's heart. That you're going to learn that social side of life is not to live to be served, but to live to serve and meet the needs of others. Then and only then will you find the peace, joy, happiness, and contentment that is available to you. You know, young people, your drive may be to become rich and famous and have everything that you ever want, but that may not bring the happiness that you're looking for. But I guarantee you, when you find people that are down and out, people that have a, a need of somebody meeting that need, someone who needs a friend, somebody who needs spiritual help, somebody that needs guidance and direction, I guarantee you, God will bless your life. So tonight, I challenge you that you'll determine tonight as you make this transition in adulthood that you can mentally visualize these four building blocks. You've got to deal with the mental side of your life. You've got to deal with the physical side of your life. You've got to deal with the side of your life that is spiritual in nature. And you've got to deal with the social side of your life if you ever expect to build a superstructure of your Christian life to be tall, strong, established for God. You'll have to follow the example of our Savior. But you might be successful operating at maximum productivity, doing what God wants you to do. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, this time I'd like to present to you the 1991 graduating class from Gilead Christian Academy. As we call out the names of each one of these students. We would like for the parents to please stand. As a surprise to you, they have purchased a dozen roses for their mothers. And we have four young ladies who would like to present these to you individually. And so as your child's name is called, would you please stand for your roses? Thank you. Rebecca Lee Robertson. Tanya Zane Stroud. Jennifer Brandy Miller. Dawn Kelly Bodry. Shelly Delee Hawkins. Stacy Elaine Harrell. Michael Lee Davis. Matthew Harrell Geary. Paul Gregory McFather. Eric Tracy Davis. Kevin J. Lucas.
Jimmy Paul Carr Jr. William Robert Watson. Kimberly Nicole Thompson. Raina Carol Unruh. Mary Esther Staley. Rachel Elizabeth Rigby. Laura Natasha Freeman. Jennifer Faye Warren. Eric Glenn Rye. Michael George Gardner. Daniel Franklin Schiff. Benjamin William Gleaton. Jody Mark Epps. Bradley Clinton Robertson. This time, I'd like to our best in this by Gilligan Baptist Church and the Board of Deacons. We now present to you the graduating class of 1991. Board class, y'all. See deer out there late? There's <laughs> corn out there tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Where's uh, Mama Dan? They probably ain't got out yet, Michael. Hold on to your diploma, Michael. What's that now? Hold your diploma up. Hold it to the camera. He's looking at it. Oh, it's not in there. Some of those people aren't getting the phone. We can pretend. Yeah. They, they got so much stuff. Mash that again. Mash it again. I don't know. Mash something else. Oh, it's still all over. 
Stacy. 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 Hug him again. I got the camera. <laughs> well, I'm gone. We're going to sex.